Yeah, do yourself a movement. So what I will be talking today would be, um, so my research is pretty much uh, under the domain of biomechanics. As you uh, probably know, uh, biomechanic research can be done at different levels, cell level biomechanical studies, tissue level biomechanical studies. My research is primarily at whole body level biomechanical study. Um, and it is focused on the lower back and involve both experimental studies and computational studies. For today, I've decided to put together the presentation the microphone still out. Okay. Does anybody know how to turn this on? Okay. Yeah. If you want, you can understand. Oh, there we go. All right. Yeah, okay. 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 All right. Yeah. Um, so I was mentioning uh, for st uh, biomechanical studies, whole body level biomechanical studies that we do with the focus on the lower back, we do both computational studies and experimental studies, but for today I've decided to just present only computational aspects of our studies. And that's pretty much about how, like the models that we use to evaluate the spinal load and also evaluate risk of cumulative damage in a spinal tissue. So here's going to be the overview of my talk. Yeah. Pretty much all research is motivated because of the importance of low back pain. I'll talk a little bit to describe that importance and then I'll try to elaborate where um, in the domain of research related to low back pain is the focus of our research. And then I'll talk about the computational model that we use for evaluation of spinal load. And then a little bit I'll talk about how we um, evaluate risk of cumulative damage in the spinal tissue. So low back pain, why is this important? It's a significant human health problem. Um, there are two different aspects to it. One is it is a very prevalent disorder, and the other is like you know that how it affects quality of life. Uh, in terms of um, the magnitude of this problem, there are so many numbers out there. In the U.S., um, it is suggested that as many as 80 percent of population experience back pain at one point during their lifetime. And then if you look at data coming from different uh, countries in the world. In terms of point prevalence, you see numbers from 8 to 20 percent in terms of like you know point prevalence, meaning like you know at any point in the time there is that number of people, that percent of population experiencing back pain. Um, there are some segments of population that the prevalence of back pain is higher among them, and among these segments of population include older individuals that we have had some research interest uh, for this population, and also individuals that they have lower limb amputation, unilateral lower limb amputation, as you can see, I'll put numbers there in terms of like, you know, how prevalence of low back pain is compared among these individuals as compared to uh, general population. In terms of impact of low back pain, um, if back pain um, is get to the chronic stage, it is considered to be the leading cause of disability in the board. It negatively affects quality of life for example, older work, like it forced older workers to retire prematurely. It is associated with opioid consumption. Half of opioid users, they report to have low back pain. And apart from like, you know, personal suffering, quality of life, it also is associated with huge cost to the society, a total cost. So management of low back pain, similar to any other disorder, can be done either through prevention efforts and intervention or to clinical treatments. Both cases, they heavily rely on information that they get from diagnosis of low back pain. Pretty much as of now, um, the diagnosis procedure for low back pain involves mainly physical examination and um, to some very like few extent medical um, imaging. The challenge that is faced for diagnosis of low back pain cause is that as many as 90% of low back pain cases, they are considered to be non-specific. So for majority of patients to go to doctors, the doctors cannot tell them what is causing their low back pain. So what will happen then like, you know, with the intervention, uh, prevention and treatment uh, effort? As related to 
prevention of low back pain, the efforts will be or are or have been focused on reducing exposure to known risk factor for low back pain. What are risk factors? Risk factors are characteristic, characteristics of the environment that the individual live in, whether it's work or like you know in the outside of the work, that have been identified to be associated with a high risk of low back pain. As related to work-related factors, they can be categorized as either being like you know uh, physical risk factor or psychosocial risk factor. Physical risk factor, for example, studies of like worker population have shown that whole body vibration is associated with higher incidence of low back pain or manner of handling. Then, so these risk factors have been identified. When we cannot identify what is the exact root cause of back pain, the effort will be focused to minimize exposure to this risk factor. For example, if whole body vibration is a risk factor, uh, uh, the intervention has focused on improved design of vehicle seats to reduce the exposure to whole body vibration on vehicles that are, you know, like the, what is that, like, you know, these military vehicles or like uh, helicopters that reduce the amount of vibration that is being transmitted to the um, operator. If it is manual metal handling, there are some um, recommendation guidance, guidelines out there. For example, there is NIOSH lifting equation that based on characteristics of lifting activity will determine what is the maximum level of load that can be uh, lifted by individuals. So this, this will be like pretty much the effort that is being made when we cannot uh, uh, determine the exact cause of back pain. We reduce exposure, we manage exposure to those risk factors. <coughs> So this is um, um, I'm just like this is not like that, that much like you know readable from the distance. But the reason I put this here, this is like you know one suggested guideline uh, for treatment of patient with low back pain. <coughs> Pretty much on the left side of the graph, um, the procedure involved rolling out um, red flags if back pain is caused, for example, by a tumor, or if it is caused by a fracture, and then. At the bottom portion of that, if those are those like red flags are ruled out, ruled, ruled out um, will be um, a recommendation to stay active, take medication, like pain medication, and if back pain resolved, the person is considered to be treated. If not, then you can see we have a loop um, on the right side. That this loop pretty much is a trial and error effort. Um, the treatment listed in the table on the right side will be tried one by one. And if the patient responds, good for patient. If not, another round of treatment, like you know, different treatments, will be um, tried. <clears throat> so this is the status quo. Prevention relies heavily on management of risk factor. Treatment for non-specific low back pain, that is a considerable portion of low back pain cases, pretty much involve a trial and error effort. Um, so still a lot of people suffering from back pain, and although a small portion of them end up like you know, developing chronic back pain, but continuous like or repeated like a recurrence of low back pain increase the likelihood of transition to chronic back pain uh, stage. So just to explain a little bit what is the focus of our research here as related to low back pain? So as I said, there is this huge interest in identification of root cause of back pain for any given patient. Okay. So what I put here is to just like this simple diagram to explain three important elements that are involved in an individual's experience of back pain. There's of course going to be a source element which could be a damage to the tissue or it could be a change in chemical environment that embed the nociceptive uh, or like pain sensitive nerve ending within the tissue. There is a sensing element that could be activated because of um, the source or it could be activated even without like you know existence of a source, perhaps due to some like you know a structural change in the nervous system, and there is 
an interpretation stage or element within the brain that is affected by psychological characteristics of the patients. So an individual low back pain experience can be affected by any of these three main elements. And there are researchers that their focus is exactly like different, uh, one of like, you know, separate elements of this like, you know, sequence. For our research, our focus is on the source. And then on the source, there are, as I said, there are different type of uh, st like stimulation that can like, you know, stimulate uh, nerve ending within the tissue. Our focus is only on mechanical source. And that's because what I put here is the motion segment of the spine. I wanted to emphasize on nerve ending that end, like, you know, in the intervertebral disc and facet joints. And there are evidence out there that shows mechanical load can either directly or indirectly stimulate these nerve ending and cause pain. So what we have tried to do, like the focus of our research is to try to characterize the mechanical environment inside the spine or inside the lower back. Or characterize the spinal load, like saying like, you know, uh, in, in other words. So spinal load is determined directly by the state of spinal equilibrium and stability. So what is equilibrium, what is the stability? Um, the equilibrium of the spine is the balance between the force applied to the spine by the muscles and ligament enabling individual to perform physical activity. So that's one side of the equilibrium. And the other side is the mechanical demand of the activity that the person wants to do. So if you want to move a trunk, we need to generate enough force inside the muscle to be able to move a trunk. That's like the first thing. If you want to lift an object, then the force should be in, even in, like, you know, increased enough to enable us not only to move a trunk, but also to be able to move the object in the space. So we have this two sides of, like, you know, forces around the spine that represent the spinal cranial. So the resultant of this interaction will determine the spinal load. But there is another aspect to this equilibrium, and that's the spinal stability. Stability of spine is a property of spine equilibrium, and that's its capacity to sustain equilibrium condition. So if we have, like if you lift the load and hold it in a given posture, so forces inside the trunk are muscle forces to the extent that hold our trunk in that given posture also like enable us to hold that load in a given height or a given like given location. But then the stability is the capacity of this system, neuromuscular system, if to just sustain that like in a given condition if it is perturbed. So to put this in context, let me just like you know, give you one example. Imagine if you want to lift a load from the floor. As you start from standing posture, you want to just like you bend forward, your forces, the forces inside your back muscle will be adjusted such to enable you to move your trunk like you know downward, um, reaching to the load, and then you will increase the forces inside your back muscles to enable you to lift the load from the ground. But imagine if that load that you're going to lift was a big, large bucket of liquid. As soon as you lift it, the liquid will start like you know moving inside that bucket. So what would you do? So like there is continuous perturbation to the load that you are lifting. Normally, you would just like stiffen your trunk, like abdominal muscles. So you're going to have to stiffen your lower back. So that means that you are coactivating your abdominal muscles, mm. muscles that were not needed if this object was a solid object. So you're adding more muscle force that should be also like balanced by back muscles. So that added activity of muscle will also increase spinal load. So the emphasize here, I wanted to put on the equilibrium stability to just, just demonstrate how these two different aspects of um, spinal mechanics, mechanics affect the loads that are being experienced at different level of the spine. So with this, here is um, how we study um, spinal load. We, not only we try to assess spinal load at different, um, when individuals perform different activity, but we are interested in knowing how different elements within the trunk contribute to that spinal equilibrium stability. So here, 
I'll just put this chart to show, like, you know, when we want to do a physical activity, how these different elements work together to provide the spine tremendous stability, and how that, like, you know, affect the loads inside the spine. So we want to perform activities, central nervous system command our muscles to be activated. Depending on how we activate our muscles, it will determine how we will move our trunk, how we will bend or lumbar, like, like the lower back. That movement pattern or that work method that we have adapted will determine how much the passive tissue, the tissues that are not generating active force, will be deformed. So that deformation will also contribute to the grouping of the spine. And then all these three together will affect the equilibrium of equilibrium stability of the spine and eventually the load that is being experienced. So if we are studying a risk factor at workplace, like let's say a whole body vibration, or if we are studying a treatment, spinal manipulation, let's say, we are interested to know if that exposure to risk factor increase the risk of developing back pain. Is it because it increases spinal load? If so, how so? Is it by changing the active response or changing the passive mechanical behavior? Or is it like, you know, because of like, you know, change that it caused in the way that individual perform activity? The same thing, like, you know, the same question we ask about, like, you know, if you're studying a treatment. All right. So we have different methods for evaluation of active and passive behavior of trunk tissues, um, uh, including like, you know, we have sudden perturbation experiment, we have passive stretch relaxation experiments, um, some movement analysis, but those are not uh, the focus of this talk. So what I want to talk about today is the computational method that we use to evaluation, evaluate the spinal load. Um, it is possible to measure spinal load, but that is not a practical method for research and it is not ethical. Um, because of that, um, there is a lot of interest um, in using mechanical models for evaluation of spinal load. There are a wide range of different mechanical models out there, starting from simple rigid body models, all the way to going like, you know, to de detailed, deformable, finite element models. Um, and depending on the level of complexity, each, each of these models will provide different type of outcome measure. Rigid body models, they will just provide information about um, net moment or net joint moment or mechanical demand of the activity. I've, they are um, also like, you know, equipped with like, you know, some muscle, a model of muscles. They can also provide some like estimate of muscle forces. So the model that we use is a finite element model of the spine, wherein the vertebrae of the spine are simulated using rigid bodies. The passive behavior of a spine motion segment. A motion segment is the two disc, um, two to the vertebrae, the disc in between, and all the ligaments that surrounding that, like, you know, um, structure. That's becoming the motion segment. The mechanical property of this segment is simulated by a beam element, like beam elements, nonlinear beam elements. Um, we also have mass and mass moment of inertia of the trunk distributed across the uh, spine at the, each level of the spine. Then the passive behavior of the spine motion segment um, is defined based using like you know um, properties coming from detailed finite element model of the spine, and these models were validated against cadaver cadaver uh, data. <clears throat> so here on the right, you can see uh, passive resistance of um, spine motion segments from T12 to S1 to uh, sagittal plane rotation, whereas on the left you can see their passive resistance to axial deformation. The model that we have um, also includes a rather detailed uh, muscle architecture. Uh, it has 56 muscles, um, 10 of them which we call them global muscles. They are attached to thoracic, thoracic region of the trunk and at the top and from the bottom they are attached to the pelvis floor um, and we have 46 muscles that are attached to different level of lumbar spine and span all the way down to the pelvic, pelvis floor. The muscles, the in simulation of muscle we tried um, to like perform wrapping of muscle wherever needed 
So if we simulate muscles using like on a straight line, um, then there will be situations that if we want to like you know simulate a bending posture, the line of action of this muscle will come too close to the actual uh, spine structure, unrealistically close, or even it can like penetrate that. So in our simulation, we prevent like you know that unrealistic like uh, approach of the muscle line of action to the structure of the spine through a wrapping mechanism to all by uh, some simple contact simulation. <coughs> So we have this uh, final element model, and we use it in a kinematic-driven approach to estimate spinal growth. And how does this um, kinematic-driven approach work is that we use measured motion of the trunk along with any load that is being manipulated by the individual and prescribe them to this FD model. The model, what, what the model will do is, it will tell us how much mechanical demand that activity is putting at each level of spine, how much of that demand is being balanced because of the deformation of the spine movement segment, and how much should be balanced or offset by actual muscle force. And then once we get the muscle force, um, it can be used to calculate spinal load compression and shear force at different spinal level. But because this model is nonlinear, we need to repeat this procedure by applying muscle force as external load to the structure. And when we apply this muscle force as external load, what will happen is that material properties that I showed you will be different. As um, spine, like flexural stiffness, will increase if like you know, compressive force are applied. So we need to apply those muscle force and see how the passive response is going to be changing and then as a result how that will affect the mechanical demand on the active tissue. This iterative procedure is like repeated a few times, three to four times. Um, and once convergence is achieved, um, the muscle force, we know like all line of action, actions of the muscles. Um, we just use simple vector calculus to calculate compression and shear force at different levels of the spine. So here I'm just going to briefly explain one application of this uh, model. A few years ago, we studied <coughs> uh, two different lifting techniques. Um, lifting with knee versus lifting with back, or what is called squat lifting versus a stoop lifting technique. Uh, there's been always this debate which one is safer. Um, there are individuals that advocate lifting with knee because it's a low bringing load closer to the body reduce the mechanical moment arm or lever arm of the load uh, with respect to the lower back. But there are others that uh, suggest that under repetitive or fatiguing activity, um, stoop lifting um, is associated with less energy consumption and also provide better balance. For us, we were interested to know um, in terms of exact, like in terms of spinal load imposed uh, on the uh, vertebral column, um, how they are different. So what we did, we had um, 15 individuals to perform um, each of these lifting, um, um, lifting of an, um, so they, we asked them like to lift a, an 18 kilogram load from the ground, um, either by squat or stoop lifting. Um, we just told them like either lift by like you know by either bending your knee or bending your back. Uh, but we didn't provide any further instruction as which, like how to do this correctly. As they performed this activity, we measured the motion of their trunk uh, using the motion capture systems. So I put here like representative of uh, thorax rotation in the sagittal plane because this was a sagittal symmetric movement, and also pelvic rotation. Um, throughout this um, few, next few slides, the, in the figures, the red color graphs represent result for stoop lifting, lifting with back, and the green color results represent the squat lifting, lifting with knee. So as you can see, starting from standing posture, assuming that there is no rotation in thorax in the top uh, uh, floor, uh, figure, um, as they bend forward, the, the amount of rotation of thorax increase more so when they perform uh, lifting with the back, 
um, and then they reach to the load, pick up the load and come back. And you can see the same thing for the pelvis rotation, which was m larger under back lifting versus uh, <coughs> uh, knee lifting. Subtracting pelvic rotation from thorax rotation, we get like you know the amount of deformation in the lumbar region. So the amount of rotation provided by that deformation. So we get this deformation and distribute it or prescribe to our model at different level based on some ratios reported in the literature. So you prescribe these things to our model. What our model will do, bottom left figure, it will tell us, okay, under each of these activity, at a certain level, what is the mechanical demand on the spine? So at the lowermost level of the spine, at the S1, as you can see, under stoop, uh, both, under both conditions, that mechanical demand increased. They reached the load around two seconds, and there is this sudden increase in that mechanical demand. They lift the load, and as they bring the load closer to the body, that mechanical demand decreased. So as you can see clearly, the, the mechanical demand was much larger under back lifting, stoop lifting. So part of that demand was internally balanced by the, because of the formation of the passive structures, passive motion segment of the spine. And under back lifting or stoop lifting, there is more deformation of the lumbar spine. And as you can see, as a result, there is more or larger contribution of passive tissue to balancing the demand of the task under stoop lifting. Nevertheless, when you subtract this passive contribution from the total demand of the task, the demand on the muscle, the, the part of that demand of the task that should be balanced by the muscle was still larger under back lifting, stoop lifting versus squat lifting. So at each level we have a moment that we know that should be balanced by uh, muscles attached to that level. Um, since at each level there are more muscles uh, than the, the number of atropium um, equation that we have, the problem becomes a redundant problem. So many different combination of muscle force can generate that moment. We adopted an optimization procedure to find the best combination of muscle force that balance that moment, but at the same time is associated with a minimized cost function, being minimized uh, sum of cubic stress inside the muscle. So this is like the demand on the muscles at the T12 level, the thoracic region. Again, love being larger under back lifting versus uh, knee lifting. From that, we get the forces. Pretty much, this is like you know, my positive moment is extensor moment. This was needed to be balanced by iliocostalis and longissimus. And as you can see, I've put here um, the active forces um, inside this muscle, and I have split them to their active contribution versus passive contribution. Passive contribution of muscle forces is because of the stretch inside the muscles. So once we have all these muscle force calculated, we can simply calculate um, compression and shear force at different level of the spine. And as you can see here, um, under stoop lifting or back lifting, the maximum compressive force experienced at the L5-S1 level reached to about 5,000 Newton. About 1,000 Newton larger than squat lifting technique. And shear force reached about like a 1,500 1, Newton. So you compare this with reported threshold of injury, numbers between like 5,000 to 10,000 Newton. Uh, clearly, uh, that is reaching that like you know reported margin of uh, injury, and this was simulation for a load of 18 kilograms. And when you compare that with uh, the limited like you know what is that the weight of the luggage weight for international flight, which is 23 kilograms, and 
luggages and you know that they are, you cannot lift them like, you know, sagittal symmetry. It's just like asymmetric lift on them, lift of, lifting of them. So you can imagine how much uh, spinal load is experienced by those luggage handlers. So this was to provide, like, you know, some more accurate information about the spinal load experience um, under these two lifting techniques. Um, when we also we also did compare like an evaluation of stability. Interestingly, stoop lifting was associated with, um, as you can see, with larger spinal load, but it was more stable, and that is like you know, consistent with the reported like a better balance of um, spine or like stability of the spine under stoop lifting technique. Once you have developed a mechanical model. And if you have validated that, then you can use the model to do so many different parametric studies. Here what we did, we did one study to see what would happen on the spinal load if for some reason that passive stiffness of the spine changed, let's say due to aging, if the stiffness because like you become higher or for some disease or disorder uh, that become weaker. So simply like you know, we increase the stiffness by 20% uh, or decrease it by 20 and 40%. So this is a straightforward matter. You increase the stiffness, the passive contribution goes up, you decrease it, it goes down. As a result, the demand on muscle um, force change accordingly. And you would, you would see like, you know, by decreasing passive stiffness, the compressive load will go up. Whereas by increasing it, the compressive force will go down. So this was a study of a um, mechanically demanding task. We also use the model for just regular activity of daily life, not that much demanding. And this study that I want to talk about briefly here is a study that we did in collaboration with a colleague uh, who is at Walter Reed uh, Medical Center in DC. Uh, they have been studying um, individuals that they have unilateral lower limb amputation, and pretty much they, um, they patients that they study, they are war fighters, um, that they got this amputation as a result of like, you know, this recent conflict in Middle East. Um, and they are, apart from their amputation, they are pretty much physically fit. So for these individuals, what has been reported was that secondary to their amputation, low back pain is a huge problem. A few years after like your amputation, they develop low back pain. And our colleague, they were interested to know whether um, spinal load experience in their spine during activity of daily living play a role, particularly because when they were looking at their, their walking pattern or their gait pattern, they observe clear abnormalities in movement of their trunk. So here, I've depicted like uh, trunk movement, uh, the lateral trunk movement shown like you know, in the left, for three groups, uh, control, and then two group of individuals with amputation, TTA representing individuals with transtibial, below knee amputation, and TFA representing individuals with transfemoral, above knee amputation. So as you can see, there are some instant of um, gait cycle. There are considerable deviation uh, from normal gait pattern. So our colleagues were interested to know what is the impact of this deviation on the loads that experience inside the spine during the walking. So we use the same model and compared the spinal load um, for controls and individuals with transfemoral, the knee amputation. So these are the results for 20 controls and 20 individuals with uh, a knee amputation. Um, and as you can see here, that's the compressive force experienced at the L5S1. Um, individuals that have amputation, they experience about 500 Newton more compressive force during each eight cycle as compared to controls. And there were some differences uh, in shearing force, uh, anterior, posterior, and medial lateral, but they were not as uh, large as compared to the compressive force. 
observing these uh, differences, the question was, how, uh, if we can relate this difference, this increase in the spinal load, to experience of back pain, like you know, in few years that has been reported among these individuals, and that was when we started to think about because we knew that like you know, this like 500 newton increase, 2,000 newton is not going to cause immediate injury. So that was why we, when we started to see, like, you know, if this can cause cumulative damage, if over time it can cause um, fatty failure of spinal tissue. There was this study uh, by Sean Gallagher from Auburn that he reported um, if the number of repetition of loading increase significantly, then the threshold of injury can also like, you know, decrease uh, substantially. So under high repetition um, loading condition, which is going to be the um, lower right side of this, uh, lower right quartile shown here, um, a loading that is as much as 30% of injury threshold of a tissue, it can cause uh, damage, like, you know, cumulative damage, fatigue damage to the spinal tissue. So we had this spinal load calculated. We knew that, like, you know, there is, like, 500. And the maximum force there reaching, like, you know, 1,800 uh, for controls and for, um, for, sorry, for individuals with amputation, for controls reaching, like, 1,200. And when we compared this with reported threshold of injury, for controls, it was much less than 30%, so there's no concern about fatigue damage. Um, for those with amputation, as you can see, like 1.8 could somehow reach to 30% of 5 kN. But this was some sort of like a speculation. Um, we had this like, you know, uh, we, we, we knew that it's going to be important, uh, but this way was not possible to make like you know, an argument. So what we did, like last year, there was this paper that was published by Motivel et al. that they proposed a nonlinear fatigue model wherein it used the stress distribution within the spinal tissue, spinal interval disc to calculate um, fatigue accumulation over time. So essentially, they would get the profile of one mice, one mice's stress, and we used that from the spinal load that I showed you in a couple of slides before and calculated the uh, one mice's stress inside the L5S1. This method that they have proposed, um, first it split or like, you know, divide the, <coughs> the profile of the stress to a number of discrete cycles. And for each cycle, it calculated the number of um, cycles needed to complete damage under that loading cycle. Then, knowing the number of, like, you know, cycle of activity, we can calculate the amount of damage for each cycle of these uh, loading or like a stress here that we have. So starting, let's say, with the smallest loading cycle, we can calculate the number of cycles needed to fatigue damage, and then knowing that individuals perform, like, you know, 10,000 steps per day, we can calculate how much damage occurred because of that smallest cycle under 10,000 step. And then from smallest cycle going to the next smallest cycle, or like the, the, the one that is a slightly like larger, we can repeat the same thing, but this time, um, we have to adjust the number of uh, repetition of activity uh, in a way to account for damage caused by the previous, or the smaller, like the, the previous smaller cycle of the loading. So that's what I have put like, you know, in this line on the right side. This is done for everything. We get uh, the amount of damage due to all of the loading cycle here. <coughs> and then we also know at the end of the day, when they go to bed, that's going to be a rest period. Right? It's going to be some recovery to happen. So we also need to just modify this formulation for the amount of recovery that happened, uh, or tissue healing that happened over the rest period. So we did this formulation, we developed this model, 
and use those spinal load calculated to predict progression or accumulation of damage uh, inside the spinal tissue. A damage value of one means complete fatigue failure. And as you can see, for an individual with transfemoral amputation with the spinal load that we have calculated, it would take about 10 years for total damage. Whereas an individuals like, you know, like with the healthy individuals, it would take up to about like, you know, 50 years for a complete damage. So what is um, the importance of this? So clinicians, they observe these abnormalities in the gait uh, movement of these individuals. The first thing that they have to address is that they enable them to perform daily activity. Then the second thing could be if they can reduce to some extent some of these um, abnormalities or asymmetries. So you can see there is asymmetries here, but the magnitude is not that large, but you have a three to four degree, as you can see, for the lateral bending and sagittal flexion extension. And that three to four degree, as you can see here, is causing about 30 years of uh, decrease in damage life, fatigue damage life of the intervertebral of this. So with this, I'm just going to, have to wrap up my talk. Um, as, you, as I tried to explain, um, or current inability to determine the exact root cause of back pain for most patients uh, has been a challenge for management, prevention, also treatment of back pain. Um, we know that uh, mechanical load inside the spine uh, can directly or indirectly cause back pain, but the challenge up to this point is um, if we can characterize or we can evaluate those that can be used for, um, again, management of low back pain. So what we are seeing here is that there is potential for some personalized modeling of spine to offer like, you know, some personalized assessment of lower back mechanical environment that can help with management of low back pain, whether at workplace or in clinic. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our funding resources and my students, and I'd be happy to answer any question that you have. pretty much on soft tissue, right? it's like disc and ligaments, mm -hmm. um, and it take into account recovery. It doesn't take into account like, you know, fatigue life of vertebrae. Yeah. So, um, you talked with me earlier about people having compensatory motion. Yes. Uh, how, how could your model uh, account for people who are, who are compensating for pain with different motion patterns uh, as opposed to normal motion patterns and, and how that might affect the, the fatigue model? So the fatigue model is primarily affected by the input of the spinal load. <clears throat> Those alteration in movement pattern can affect the spinal load in turn. Um, looking at the patient, what we can observe and measure confidently is the changes in motion. But what we don't have much confidence is if the predicted muscle force that we have is representative of the actual muscle force activation. So our model, the FD model that I showed here, is an equilibrium based. It doesn't take into account the stability requirement. So if someone coactivate the muscles, this model will not see that. We can enforce like you know some stability criteria criterion there, but as of now, it's just like you know, whatever that is observed by the model is going to be based on changes in the movement pattern, not personalized changes in the way that they recruit their muscles. Is 
when you're doing the motion analysis studies of the movements um, for the inputs, are you also doing any AMG measurements for the ways and the validation Yes, we have done that. Um, um, in fact, this model has been extensively, like its outcome being compared to the EMG under both static condition and dynamic condition. Um, we did one study of like looking at the effect of trunk motion on the spinal cord. For that study, we compared the result with measured EMG. Um, um, validation with EMG is just going to be if, in terms of pattern, there is any relationship because how muscle measured EMG is related to force. That is not known, right? Um, but we also looked at um, ground reaction force and tried to see if the pattern of ground reaction force is like, or I'm sorry, like the, the reaction force we get from the basic uh, basis of our model is consistent from what is measured from the force plate. Um, we did some perturbation study. Were in the put individuals inside this device that had like the load cell and moved their trunk back and forth. Um, that device had a load cell. Um, so when we put this movement, the force, the reaction force that we saw for that movement from the model was also consistent with what we were reading from the load cell. So like some sort of indirect validation of the model. If there are no more questions, we'll thank our speaker.